All right, the Reds, it's an Anfield app special. Delighted to have Phil Thompson in the studio with us today. Uh, this is part of our content around what was a brilliant season, the treble season, 2001, one of the greatest times to be a Liverpool fan, certainly for people of my generation. <laughs> and I wanted to start with that, Phil. I mean, it was it was amazing as a fan. And, like I went to so many games, went to all those finals. It was the first European final I'd been to as a fan. I mean, your your history, Phil, your record, what you won as a Liverpool player is unbelievable. You won everything. So I was wondering when I was preparing for this interview, where does 2001 rank for you in your life? Because, you, you know, you've lifted the European Cup. You've done everything as a player. Well, we've done doubles when when we were players and, you know, UEFA Cups, League Championships. And and it was, it was fantastic. But I think what sets that apart is timing. Timing is everything. And you look at them. To win the League Cup, again, under Gerard Houllier, it was a fantastic moment. Said to the players, we need to crack it. We need to win the first one. Mm. Others didn't realise what was to come. We'll hopefully follow. But that was the importance. And then the great thing about it is that sort of week, Arsenal, Alaves, and then Charlton, you couldn't paint that. The thing what you just said there, for me as a fan, I thought about the Alaves, because I think it was like 16 or 17 years since we've been to a European final. And there was people of your generation I felt for because they'd heard the stories yeah. of European exploits from their dads, from their granddads. And now it was your turn. So things like that made it special. For me, what we did as a player was wonderful, was great. We did it year after year. This gave a set of fans something to really be pleased about and like to really to enjoy. Yeah, it was putting Liverpool back on the map, wasn't it? It was putting Liverpool back at the top because I think, as you say there, Phil, we, we obviously grew up on European Cups and all the rest of it, but, but we weren't there for a lot, a lot of us. We're, we're not, you know, we read about it in books, we watched DVDs, whatever. We've we seen interviews with the likes of yourself and we were like, we want our bit of this. And when we went to Dortmund, unbelievable. But I want to wind back to the very start of that season. I, I always I look at it now and, and at the time as well. The signings, you know, before the season even started, it was a, it was a statement of intent that wasn't it. You know, getting Marcus Babbel to Liverpool, I was so excited about that. He was a world class player, wasn't he? And he was coming to Liverpool, and that was like bang, Marcus Babbel's coming to Liverpool. These were these were statements when we when we had done it again as needs must. I don't think making seven signings ever does anybody any good unless you need them. And I think we, at the time, we had to make that change. We had to evolve the squad because we, we felt we the team was drifting. Me just going back as a fan before coming with with Gerard, Gerard Houllier in, in sort of 1999, we felt that need. Um, the Sammy Hoopier, Stefan Henshaw, I can remember we'd had Stefan in the bag, but it was looking for another one. And just speaking to Gerard, and he'd gone, mm, Phil, we, you know, we need sort of centre back. And I said, No, Gerard, you're wrong. We don't need a centre back. And he went, What do you mean? Of course we do. And I went, No, we need two. And it was those sorts of things, those sorts of statements of knowing that you needed two quality centre backs for you to compete. The seven signings, looking at them, yeah, you're obviously going to take a chance with them. Eric Meyer yeah. came in. Eric was a good presence in the dressing room, was a winner, maybe didn't have the quality, but we had to do an assignment with Marcus Babbel, knowing what he'd done for Bayern Munich, and we were, we were getting him on a free. A lot of people do this, run down contracts, but to have him coming in was 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 massive. And then we made signings again the following year, trying to just build on it. Um, but I think there was there was some terrific signings in, in what we did, some bad ones as well, by the way. <laughs> but we won't go there at the moment. No, let's keep it positive. Um, I mean, the game, the season as a whole, there, 63 games. So Liverpool end up playing every game they can possibly play that season. Uh, scored 127 goals. Um, you, you know, you're a pundit, Phil. You, 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 you're part of the football conversation that goes on now as well. You'll hear everyone talk a lot about, you know, fatigue, mental fatigue, rotation, all of those things. 
what was going on behind the scenes to be able to perform to the level Liverpool did for that many games in that season? Well, we, we obviously had to try and do certain things like that. We analysed. We didn't have all these people now looking in the red zones. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, a whole host. We had a fair amount of staff. But now you look at what um, the likes of Jürgen has and even Rafa developed even further than us. They, you know, yeah, and all kinds of people look... You were looking at sort of preparation and that recovery, but in a massive way. You know, you had all these special coaches and everything. I was amazed. I went sort of abroad with Rafa Benitez. I was with Liverpool as an ambassador going, me and Rushi. And we got down on, on the plane after one of the pre-season games. I, I couldn't believe it. There was like sort of six people all got laptop sounds and they all started... Sh -sh 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 piling stuff into it from the games. I thought, wow, we didn't have any of this yeah. to sort of have a, have a look at. It was these, and it was these from your experience of what you knew of looking at players and seeing them and sensing them in training, of, of whether they had fatigue. So you knew as much in training as you did on a match day. You had to be aware of players not being as sharp, but we didn't have the squad. Anyway, near the squads that became Rafa, came certainly with Jürgen and the amount of players that teams have as squads. So we had to adapt. Quite obviously, your, your centre-backs, your full-backs probably remain the same ones um, if you can keep them. But in, in other areas, we tried to change it. So I think they were important aspects. But we certainly, as then, we made full use of the squad that we had. And it was, it was absolutely terrific. Well, you know, on that 63 games played that season, so uh, the, the the list of appearances for that season, Westerveld plays in 61 of them, wow. Babel in 60, Carragher in 58, Hippier in 58, Heskey in 56, Haman 53, Hensho 53, Gerard 50, McAllister 49. So there's a lot of, a lot of players playing a lot of games there. Um, as you say, I mean, you know, the, you, you've used the squad as well, as you say, but you've relied on this core. There's a nucleus, like, absolutely. Yeah. It's a core of what you go through of, of your players. Uh, and it is. That, that's incredible, even for sort of relative modern day. Because mm. you went back, we were, we were playing that as players. We had 42 league games. We got to the final, a lot of cups when I was a player. So that become on, on small, that was the norm. But as things moved on, you, you did have to, because of the intensity of games, what you were doing, you had to try and rotate them to bring in fresh mm. legs. Um, so it was important. That even just the other day, talking about 2001, I had Didi a man moaning, saying he played <laughs> against Alaves, played the 90 minutes and, well, and the extra time to where we went, and then he wasn't in the squad. Never mind, he wasn't even on the bench for the, um, for the Charlton game. So that was it, but you were looking at it, you needed fresh legs after the FA Cup game, after the UEFA Cup game. So I think it was important to give them that, but you see those players there, certainly the likes of Stevie getting prominence. And mm. Marcus Babel, I think it was probably the next season after that, that he had his illness and goodness knows how he pushed his body through it that year, but what a sign and he was. Yeah, it was super what a you're probably not known and behind the scenes, but terrific player. Maybe not the most. Reminded me a little bit the way he trained, of a little bit like Alan Hansen, where Al had ambled round the training ground and everything, but saved it for the for the Saturday. And that's what as managers, that's where the magic happens. And that's yeah. where you need your players. And Marcus was like that. You knew you could rely upon him, but you had like a what, a six foot two, six foot three, right back was always good. And then you had Stefan and then you had Sammy and you had Cara, who was a good header of the ball. So, you know, you had a good basis of a team. And there were some really tough times in this season. There's a period there you play six games in 14 days, which is unbelievable. And, and Hule, understandably at the time, wasn't happy about that. Um, but, you know, there's Barcelona in there, there's Wickham in there in the FA Cup. You have to play Ipswich as well. It's, it's to me as a player, that's success. You know, Gerard's looking going. at it and he's trying to sort of get the best out of it, feed things into, into people's minds. To me, that tells us we're doing something right on the yeah. pitch. You know, if we, if we were only playing 50 games, 
it means I might have had a good cup run in one, but you're playing 63 games. So that is so important. We are doing well. And it's, you just have to, again, as I say, prepare well and then recover well. Recovery is always, don't forget, it's, it's the players, how they handle it. A lot of the players, are they included? It doesn't matter. You'd rather play matches than train all mm. the time. No matter whether we geared the training, I would like to think perfectly to keep the players fresh to do it. We had little Sammy Lee doing a lot of the training and, and his, his um, thing on certain days would be go, just make it enjoyable, just have a laugh. And he'd think of all kinds of things just to sort of trigger, to take the minds off things. We go up to David Lloyd, can we say names like that? Can we drop names? Yeah. We'd go up to David Lloyd and we'd, you know, the players would come in and as the warm down, instead of doing it at Melwood, we'd go, right, we're off to um, David Lloyd. And we'd have a warm down in the pool. Some would go up on a, on a bike. Some would have the massage. We'd rotate. And then we'd have a chicken burger and chips. And from the good food <laughs> at Melwood, from to go there, I had a big list like that. I'd ring up the David Lloyd, start preparing all that. And the players would sit down with all the other people in there. And they'd all be like that, looking at them. And he'd have chi uh, chicken burger <laughs> and chips. And it was great. So the change in things yeah, yeah, yeah. and having different voices. Gerard was good at that. I didn't often do sort of a team talk. Or what, but he'd go, right, you do this today, Phil. I always done the video analysis, not trawling through it, but um, giving it over to the players before every game. And that was hard. Because without looking too far ahead, you'd play on a Saturday, play on a Tuesday or a Wednesday and then a Saturday. So you didn't want to start preparing and having a look. But I'd have the video guy trawling through, get me the set plays, get me anything that he could see in there. And then I'd go through them and pick things out. So you had to keep on doing them all the time yeah. and have the players um, organised and ready for it. So it was, it was good, as you can see enjoyable yeah and the, the, I want to talk about some of the sort of the key players from that season and you know we could sit here and talk for a long time I think but so I'm just going to pick a couple out that I think people would be interested in I think the obvious one is is Gary McAllister uh, we always end up talking about Gary McAllister in this season um, a bit of a shock sign and I think it was fair to say a sign in which I remember at the time a lot of people being like you know, he's old, he's past it, why are we getting this fella in? Well, what was your feelings when you, when Julio said we, you were going for him? I landed that fan in the dressing room because that's exactly what I said to Gerard when he said, you know, we've got a chance to sign in, Gary. And I said, oh. he said, what do you think, Phil? And he was always quite open and I, I'd be honest with him. And I said, Gerard, do you think this is sending out the right message. I said, because we are trying to portray, and we keep telling the fans, we're trying to bring the age uh, down of the team, of the squad, and we're getting all these young, hungry players. We're going for a 35-year-old. That's smacking in the face of, of what you're telling the fans. And he went, I'm listening to everything you say, Phil. And he says, but that's the exact reason why we need a Gary McAllister. He said, because these young lads need a bit of guidance. Mm. And if we're going to need somebody for a bit of guidance, we need a good professional. He says, I'm listening to Gary. I've just come off the phone to him. He said to me, I'm not coming there to babysit and look after and try and help these people. I want to play. Mm. I want to be on the pitch. And I went, well, if that, that is obviously, you go, wow, that is somebody who, who is a belief in their ability, but don't feel like the past it. And I said, well, fair play, I'll go to your better judgment. I said, yeah, let's do it, let's, let's go for it. So he came in and it was a masterstroke, I think. He's become a two season absolute leg legend yeah. and deserves it. Because I think the second half of that season, we've had the Gerard final, we've had the miracle of Istanbul. That is Gary McAllister's season. Yeah. It should be renamed at them. Because you see the important goals he scored. I think he's got four league goals, four league games on the trot. So it's incredible stats what he piled up. Yeah. And boy. And was... he, did, he did do the babysitting though as well, isn't it? Because I always remember being at a game. I can't remember what game it was, but I just, I just remember hearing him. You know, sometimes you can hear the players on the pitch. And I could hear him talking to Gerard. You know, just talk, just saying like, you know, squeeze, squeeze or pull in or do that. And, and just giving him a little bit of instruction on the pitch. I mean, obviously, Gerard's an absolutely brilliant player, but 
He did a bit of that, didn't he? Yeah, but Stevie was still very young then. Yeah, yeah. And needed guidance. And it's all right. A 35 year could go out there and look after himself and take care of himself because yeah. I need to preserve me. But what he do with his knowledge and he transmitted that on the on the pitch. And it was it was great for us to be able we can tell him at half time, we can tell him after the game or, or before the game. But for somebody to be out there and just giving them, you just need to listen to Stevie now and him say how Gary helped him. And it was, it was things like that. If you could really get, when you've got no fans in the stadium at the moment, you could really hear a Gary, Gary McAllister mm. and what he actually brought to the table. And it, it showed it because when, <laughs> when he wasn't picked to play against Arsenal in the FA Cup final, he was not happy, Chappie. <laughs> Absolutely was not. I think it was just the fact that he had to sit there on the bench in that heat yeah. with the sun pouring down on, on his, his bald head. Was, I don't know whether really you remember. He got the, like, yeah, like the, the ice bucket. Was... No, it was a towel. He and he towel? soaked it in the ice <laughs> and had it over his head. But he was absolutely furious, he was. But he come on and made an impact. Yeah. You know, supplied that, um, the assist, really, for that first goal for Michael. Yeah, it was an unbelievable that final. Um, on the goal scorers in the side, um, I think I always find it a bit of a shame what what how things have gone in terms of my, how Michael Owen is perceived now mm -hmm. because of where he went and what he did with the rest of his career. I always try and balance it a little bit when we're having conversations about that and say he was phenomenal. He was unbelievable. And that season, 24 goals for Liverpool. But just too often, Emil... Now, I still think he's really downplayed as what he did for Liverpool because that season, he was phenomenal for Liverpool, wasn't he? You know, the, the hat-trick at Derby, wasn't it? There was a goal at... You know, and they were, they were unbelievable strikes. It's only, only two words for that, and it's Robbie Fowler. And it was the transition, what was happening, and Emil and Michael were becoming the more prominent um, pair, and... And it was hard, and people love Robbie, and rightly yeah. so. But it was it was things that you could see happening. We had three captains come through that season: Sammy Hupia, yeah. uh, Jamie Redknapp, and and Robbie. And it was it was difficult. And and I know exactly where you're coming from with Michael. And it was one of the things which upset me a lot when he came back first with Newcastle, and people started to taunt him about where he was in Istanbul and all this. And I thought, and then with Man United, and I can understand people's thing, but I thought, and the booing of him, and I thought, nah, Michael, remember what he did for mm -hmm. us and take that and hold that in your heart and just don't do anything at all. If you don't want to clap him or applaud him or cheer for him, which I know you can't because you're Liverpool fans and it's Newcastle and it's Manchester United. But just don't do anything at all. Just, he's another player in the opposition. I'd rather that have done it. When I, when I was here in the boo and I was like that, certainly when he was with Newcastle, I did feel for him. And I thought, oh my goodness. But there was that, Emil also, Emil didn't really get the credit that he had. No. And they become one of the most feared partnerships in the Premier League and in Europe. You look what they did for England. It was it was quite astonishing. So for for two years, those two terrorised defenders, and and that's where we had a lot of joy. And you know, Michael certainly reaped the benefits of a big man alongside him. But Robbie's prominence that season tells its own story. And we also had um, Yari Lippmann, yeah, who people tend to forget, but he was a great player. But trying to pigeonhole. Yari into our side at times was very, very difficult when you were playing like a 4-4-2. Mm. It was hard then to have a Yari playing just off people because of the amount of strain it put on then the midfield. You mentioned Fowler. I mean, he gets 17 um, goals that season, plays in 48 games. He clearly felt, though, that he should be first choice mm. and he, he's talked about it a lot. And, he, you know, in his books and stuff like that, he, he, there's almost like a, a tinge of disappointment. I know that... Like Westerveld said recently, you know, Robbie, 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 Robbie doesn't forgive him that it, you know, sort of his goal isn't the winning goal in the away for cup final and yeah. things like that. Obviously, he scores that belter against Birmingham in the League Cup as well, but it, it, it then goes to penalties. 
it's not all rainbows and unicorns, is it, Phil? You know, the job you were Football's doing. Football's like that. And, and so, so tell us a little bit about, you know, how tough it was to manage someone like Robbie in that situation where you've got that other talent up front. Do you know, it was, it was fantastic. But at, at the time, us as coaches, you're trying to see. Robbie had some serious injuries, mm. knee and ankle um, injuries, which were curtailing them. Trying to get there, I think he was just coming back from a, the bad knee injury he had. I think it was was it in Ireland that we were on a pre-season, and he went to poke a goal in, and, and the keeper come out and he right on his ankle and rolled his. That was the pre-season, ankle, wasn't pre-season it? Pre-season yeah. game, and that then wham banged him back again. So it was hard for Robbie to get that little bit of movement off the pace. So it was curtailing. His thing. So we, as as sort of Gerard, myself, the staff, you've got to try and sort of get the best out of all the team. And Robbie's made a massive impact that year. But Robbie wants to play. Yeah. Robbie feels he should be the first. Not Michael Owen, not Emily Asky, not all the... And you've got to sort of appreciate somebody's passion for the game, but also our job. And it's funny because I did an interview with Cara and Robbie just a couple of weeks ago now. And it was funny how Robbie perceived it now as coming out of the game, finishing your career, going into management. How do you see things differently? Yeah. And Robbie says, I was selfish. He said, and I thought, which you have to be. And I was saying, you've got to be like that. You've got to have belief in yourself. Yeah. He said, but I always thought I should be in there. Nothing. Do the players have not? Nothing on me. I should be the... He said, and it was me, 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 me. Not even thinking of who's going to be playing alongside me or who's going to be playing in midfield. He, and I, I thought, I thought that was a real maturity mm. from Robbie. And how Robbie spoke about Gerard Houllier after Gerard's death was wonderful. Because Robbie, of all people, could have gone, you know, my goodness, I hate the guy, you know, for what he did and everything. And he gave a wonderful eulogy of, of what he actually, Gerard Houllier actually done for the club, for him, although it wasn't going right. And I thought that was marvellous. And mm. it, was, it was a touching moment for all what Robbie went through. And when the Leeds thing come along, you, you couldn't deny that. I felt awful because I was an interim manager. I was there because Gerard was obviously ill. Mm. He was in his apartment. And, Gerard and Rick rang me one day and he said, uh, we'll let Robbie go to Leeds. And I went, oh, thanks very much. <laughs> I thought, right, right on my call, right on my watch. And of course, you've got to put it across that, you know, as much as we would like them to have stayed, he wanted to play regular. Mm. And you can understand that. And, and it was, we had to make decisions and Robbie wasn't playing as much um, that following season. And it, it was a big, big shock on my watch. Yeah, bet you were made up with oh, that absolutely. one. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, this season, there are so many games you can pull out, so many go- go- you know moments, goals, etc. I wanted to see if you knew what this headline was, so um, I'll tell you the first bit of it and see if you can fill in the gap. So, after 3,240 minutes, 296 fouls, 28 buttons, and 133 goals, what what happened in this in this season, in the treble season? It's United lose at Old Trafford to Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool's record at Old Trafford at this point was awful. We haven't yeah. won there for 10 years. United were unbeaten, as that headline says, in two years. Liverpool go there, Danny Murphy scores, you were a part of that. And you've said already in this interview, you're a fan as well. How good was it after all that time to go and win at Old Trafford? Do you know what? It was absolutely fantastic because... Julie, if you remember, we lost there in the, in the cup in the last minutes, hence the Solskjaer song. Yeah. And that was devastating, devastating for us. And I think we'd also lost at Anfield in our very first game. Um, and then that game, after the cup game, I think Gerard said, we will beat Man United and we will beat them sooner rather than later. I tell you now, we... And I thought, oh, that was a brave saying. So after that game, it, <laughs> it was astonishing. What normally happens after uh, matches, 
when your staff usually go into whoever's boot room and you go and have and you you, you sit down you chat yeah. you don't chat about the game that's just gone you chat about what's coaching what you do what you, how's the family how's the kids how's things you talk about anything rather than what's just gone on with you one lost or drawn that is the norm you yeah. never gloat or you never be too despondent so we're in there and uh, Mickey Field had said, come in, have a drink after the game. So we said, okay, it's just literally outside our dressing room. So we've come in, gone through the door, what you want? Beers, foods, all there, help yourself, lads. Yeah, it's good, what, what, you know, what's it like? You just got to do all these games being played, blah. And you're like that inside, and you're going, and we just, we just <laughs> beat knees, and I'm just wanting a late. You can imagine what I was like, and I thought, Ferguson comes in, and he goes like that, and he goes, uh, all right, all right. And he stands, there's a television just above the door like that. And he goes like that. And he goes, starts looking at television. Doesn't even make conversation. And we're thinking, what do we say? What do we do? <laughs> Next thing, the door flew open like that. Nearly wiped Ferguson out. And Hule comes in and he goes, what a win, boys. How good was that? Knew we could win here. And I'm going, like that's a Gerard, you don't do things like this. But the emotion in him just overtook him. And Ferguson, who was his big mate, was like, ah, you bastard. <laughs> and it wasn't all the joy that Ferguson had had against us in those previous years, certainly in Roy's years. And uh, we were turning it round and we, we went on to have an absolute terrific record against them. And it was wonderful. Even, dare I say it myself, when I was interim, we had... I had two games against Fergus and two wins, so it's not bad, 100% record. Yeah, it was great to start winning against them again. It had been 10 years, as I say, since we'd won our old staff, and it'd been five years since we'd had any kind of win. So to go there and win was absolutely brilliant in the December. I think the other one uh, we've got to ask you about, Phil, is obviously... And it was a double that year as well, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, we'd done the double over well. which Yeah, had... correct. Um, the derby, though, the derby at Goodison. Which, um, which one was that? <laughs> 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 it's unbelievable though isn't it, it it's 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 um, you know it's embedded in everyone's minds it's one of those moments in Liverpool history I think we will all always remember Gerard's face you know that goal the fact that we're down to 10 men what happened afterwards as well I mean I'm putting words into your mouth but you you know you tell us about it from your perspective well don't forget we'd lost to Leeds yeah. who were they were the ones who were pushing us for third place to get because there was only three teams who qualified for the Champions League so they were pushing for us they had a good side then a proper good side so they beaten us at Anfield the week before so going into this game and of course it's it's absolutely massive it's being built up all this is going to go on we races to we go into a 2 0 lead and in the it's game, back to two two, isn't then it? Then it's back to two two. Um, Jeff Winter, does he give them a penalty kick for? Don't you penalty? Oh my <laughs> God! I remember speaking to him quite a few years later, and I said, I said, what? and he went, "You don't realise that when you're put under pressure by fans." He says, "And that, yeah, I may have lent a little bit because it was right in front of the Gladys Street, wasn't it?" And I may have let Lent a little. And I said, said, that's not the answer you should be giving me. I said, you should be saying, no, that was a penalty and that's what I believe. And not, you got bent by the, by the crowd. Anyway, it was, we went down to 10 men. And you're going, oh my goodness, this is, and then it goes 2-2. Two, two, and you're thinking, we're hanging on here. Mm. And it was a funny story because at the Champions League final against Spurs in Madrid, I'm watching the training that, the night before, and who comes along to speak to me? Well, Gregory Vignal, who was our left back at the time. And he, he came up to me, Phil, how are you? And everything, he came on as sub. So I said, do you know what you're most famous for? And they were pulling, he went, like what? And I said, who won the free kick for the Gary McAllister um, free kick against Everton in that game at Goodison Park, the three two? And he went, that was me. I says, that's why you're famous. I said, you on the free kick, rampaging forward, which was about 40 yards. Then Gary gets the ball. He takes it forward another. There was no magic spray then. Mm. Gary takes it forward about another five, seven yards. Um, and you, what, you've got to put yourself in Gary McAllister's mind. This is the last minute. It's a free kick. 
we've all gone up because it, this is our best chance of scoring now being down to 10 men everybody's gone up the far post and Gary's given it that and he's going get everybody and you can see Paul Gerard is it yeah he's starting to edge like Either that way, yeah. but to still take that on and put it hit it as well as he did low into the bottom corner 44 yards bit 44 <laughs> yards but who would have took that on knowing know. that if that's what you've done and you put that wide and everybody's up there, it's in the 94th minute or something, yeah. he'd have got hammered. The players who'd have gone up there would have criticised. We might have criticised them, but he had that strength of mind to say, I'm going to take this on. Now, that was incredible. The other incredible thing is they're all piling on each other, all the players. Sammy Lee's there as I well. <laughs> So how Sammy, because the game's not over, they've got to kick off. So Sammy's in the middle of this. I know. And I'm going, oh my goodness. I was jealous. <laughs> but you see Gerard's face, he's like that in wonderment. Yeah. This is the magic of Liverpool. And it, why that was, I, I think that gave us the impetus. Now, with it being 2-2, two -two, even at 2-2, two -two, I think the Everton crowd had all remained because they thought that they were denying us Champions League chance um, and it was great so us to score so late on it was just brilliant but it did give us that drive you can imagine the dressing room mm. which was absolutely buzzing there was no words you had to sort of give them a G up or anything or we still got that was the driving force Derby game last minute it was down to 10 men everything about it did you was, have a pint with Everton was, after that? I think we did actually <laughs> went in then. It was honestly, it was like it was it was like a wake going on in their dressing room because yeah, their little room was just off it, and you always did win, lose or draw. You had to do the decent thing and invite and go in and have uh, a drink after the game. Uh, we know about the finals. The finals are famous. The finals are being talked about a lot at the moment. Uh, just wanted to get you on Charlton as well because. Uh, you mentioned before, you know, there was only three places in the Champions League. It was important for Liverpool to get into the Champions League. We played all of these games. There's the situation with Robbie, as, we, as we've already talked about. That Charlton game was almost like a cup final in itself, wasn't it? You know, it was Liverpool had to win that after everything else to get that place and get in the Champions League. And, and Robbie scores an amazing goal that day. Yeah, because it was vital. Because the year before, we'd lost in the last game to Bradford, which kept yeah. Bradford up, which could have got us in the Champions League. And I think a lot has been said that maybe it was a godsend because of that, how young those players were, it was maybe the Champions League wasn't right for us at that time. So going into the UEFA Cup, which was quite incredible, was good, but we didn't want to go back into that. We wanted to be with the big boys. Now was our time. Now we were growing. We were evolving. We needed Champions League football. So it was massive. So that game coming away at Charlton, Leeds still, I think Leeds needed us to be beaten, them to win. So it was it was a huge, huge match. And after coming after the, because it was boiling in um, against Arsenal in Cardiff, mm. it took a lot out of the players because we were pushing for that last 20 minutes. If it had gone to extra time, I don't know what would have happened. We needed to win in the 90 minutes and we did. But then going to Alaves and again playing the extra time and that was very humid. If you remember, it yeah. was really sort of hot there. Then we had to prepare for the Charlton game and Gerard had told the lads, we're not celebrating after, right. no after Arsenal. No drinking, which we didn't do. Alaves, no drinking after that game. And I think we didn't get back because we had to keep on ringing the hotel and tell them to keep putting the food back, keep it heated if, if you want because we were going to be late so it was about two o'clock getting back then and then we were leaving at about 10 the next morning so all these things and you think child we need this we need this game so nobody had a drink that night and except for Didi a man which he told me a couple of weeks ago that him and Sander found this bar in underneath in the hotel that we were at and went for a sneaky few drinks and I thought you bastard I thought all the lads were and I told Robbie and Cara and they went, they never invited us because we didn't have a drink. So it was, and Didi says it was because he was back in his, in his home country that he felt like he deserved to go and have a drink. So that was, that was it. But going to Charlton, all the preparation, 
getting down there again. That was a Wednesday. This was now Friday. We'd, we'd gone down for Charlton. Still, Gerard said, we will not celebrate until we know we've made this Champions League spot. The game was probably one of the most, the poorest first halves I'd witnessed all season. It was shocking. It was dreadful. We were rusty. We'd look leggy. It just didn't happen for them. And Sander Vestival probably had his greatest 45 minutes for us. I know he'd saved the uh, penalty kick against Car uh, Cardiff. But, not Cardiff, Birmingham mm. down there. And you were like that. You were thinking, oh my goodness, he was saving so many efforts. You were thinking, how has this happened? So got him in there at half time. Julio gave him a few little changes and all that. And we went out there. We could have been four down, but we could have won the game by seven. Second half, oh, we were like Barcelona, Real Madrid on heat. <laughs> it was just incredible. Robbie scores an amazing overhead kick. Yeah. Um, uh, that Michael Michael gets. Does Robbie get Robbie get two? Robbie got two. Yeah. And and Danny Murphy got one, and it was just sensational. And it was one of those things where you went, wow. When you got to four nil, you're going, where did that come from? And at the final whistle, we as, a, we as a group of the coaching staff had our own little huddle, because it was all over then. It was finished, it was done doing all our hard work had come to fruition. And we just hugged each other, the emotion then. But the players were just absolute, for what they'd done, 63 games. Yeah. And it had come, and three cups, and the Champions League, three cups. And it was a wonderful way to finish the season. And then we stopped at Sainsbury's, not far from the ground, and we loaded up the coach with booze. And it was great. Gerard said you can... And the coach pulled boots. up, and he went. We sent the, the coach driver into the um, into Sainsbury's, and he'd come out with trolleys full of champagne, wine, beer, and the bus was <laughs> like that. And it was celebrated all the way back, and Gerard told the players, nobody takes a car out of this car park. He says, you can go and do what you want. Because you imagine four hours yeah. going back was absolutely fantastic. And to bring it back around to how we started, Phil, talking about how you know that whole season was a, a special one for, for fans of a generation who hadn't felt a part of stuff that had gone on in the past. It ends with, and I think this is quite, has, has got a little bit lost in the last 20 years. People talk about the parades for the Champions League and stuff like that. There was obviously a parade for winning this treble. And the scenes in town, I was there. It was it was amazing. And what was that like, Phil, to be on that bus with the boys, with the three trophies, going around the city? It was, you know, it. it, it you don't see many pictures or footage of that one. No, do no, you? I'd I'd done I'd done many sorts of of the Brought the, the bus tours around yeah. the round the round the city, and it was fantastic. That was great. What I could remember of them, and but this one was just exceptional. And as much as I'd seen doing mine. It seemed as though it, the crowd had doubled and as though people, don't forget, you had three cups yeah. to show which photographs for people to take then was quite phenomenal. And it, and it was, and it, it, it's hard to explain and it was good. And I, I don't think, coming back to it, that treble, that tour round the city that, again, some youngsters had not witnessed before, um, we should have been thankful for more than what we actually do. And I know we're, we're, it's 20 years now and we're, we're highlighting it. And I really think it was because 2005, the miracle of Istanbul, coming quite soon after it. I think that, for all what evolved with that, the emotion of that game, I think a lot of people just failed to recognise what an achievement that actually mm. was. I know you've heard Cara say, that was the best time of my life. Yeah. He said, as much as how great that, as a one-off game Istanbul was, this period of time over all those games, particularly when we had the turn of the year, was just absolutely football heaven. Yeah. And I, I think, I know from the, the lads I go the match with who are my age, we say that's the best period we've ever had mm. as fans. We love I, it. And it was sad. It was sad because I, I've had this, and, and I do the tours at Anfield, and and I've often told people because they always ask, and they have that big flag in front of the cop when they they had it, and they had Shanks, Bob, Joe, uh, Kenny, Rafa, 
and there was no, no Gerard Houllier. And I always felt that was harsh. It was like a silhouette yeah. of the heads. Yeah. And, I, and I noticed from it, well, it's what we done. It was because, you know, he didn't maybe win the sort of Champions League. And I, mm, Kenny didn't, you know, win a Champions League. He did as a player, but he didn't as a... Mm. And I thought that, that was... And obviously, Shanks won the UEFA Cup, but didn't win. And I always thought, mm, they would find excuses what to do. But I always, be, we're now we're talking about it. Yeah. And it wasn't just those three. It became five in six months with the game against Bayern Munich in Monaco. Yeah. And I, that was the most incredible game. The pitch was absolute crap. <laughs> and we played that, the game and we were 3-0 up against Bayern Munich. And this was, we were seeing this team, and then we go and win the Charity Shield. But the one I came, is Bayern Munich, Gerard come to see me, and he come into my office, and he went, Phil, Phil, we don't get a bonus if we win the Super Cup. The Super Cup was never up there on our, mm. you know, because the league was the most important things, then the European Cup, it was, and he was like that, the Super Cup. To Europeans, the Super Cup was massive, Absolute massive, and we were just like that. And I was well, Gerard. And he went, I'm gonna see Rick now. I'm gonna tell him. Oh my goodness, we need to come back. We got a nice Brucey bonus for it, <laughs> <laughs> which helped matters. But it was the, it was the importance of it to Gerard, and he mm. wanted that Super Cup, and you know to win then the charity. So to have five trophies was was absolutely phenomenal. What a year that was. It was indeed. Uh, Phil, thanks very much for coming in and talking to Pleasure us today. Nice. Uh, we could certainly keep on going, uh, but we'll have to draw the line somewhere. Uh, but yeah, a fantastic season, a fantastic year, and hopefully an interview there with Phil Thompson that you've enjoyed. That has been an Anfield Rap special.